and I'm extremely excited about this one. And judging from the number of people registered, I think there'll be a lot of interest. Before we get underway, as we have now done 16 webinars, as I mentioned, um, hosted by the Brain and Mind Centre with myself, Sally Gainsbury, and Assistant Professor Khalil Philander at Washington State University. We are going to be sending everyone who is registered a very, very short survey. It's really important for us to get a really good understanding of who are coming to these webinars, whether it's interesting to you, what other topics you're interested in, whether we should continue to do this if it's content you still want to receive, or if it's way too much and you're all ready for a break. Uh, obviously the, the lockdown and the, the current global situation is continuing longer than any of us probably would have thought. Uh, we initially came up with this webinar series as a way to fill the gap. We were all aware of all the conferences that were being canceled. We were thinking about all the people who had prepared materials for their conference presentations that were then subsequently canceled. And so we really wanted to provide this opportunity. We never envisaged that it would necessarily go this long, but it's been really fun and exciting and we continue to get really good feedback. So if you want to keep hearing these webinars, please fill out this very short survey and let us know that you're enjoying it and we will keep providing excellent speakers for you, which is such a joy and a pleasure. Now, one of the other really main aims for us as running this webinar series was to enable a platform for all the people who were graduate students or early career researchers who absolutely rely on conferences as a way to meet other people, to share their knowledge and to be introduced to the research world. This has been a pivotal platform for both Khalil and myself in developing our careers. It's actually where we met and where I met many of the people who we've had on our webinars. And we know it's just such a vital, important part. Now, while we can't meet face to face, obviously we were thinking, how can we provide this some sort of platform? How can we fill this void for all the upcoming graduate students who really need to put their face out there before they hit the job market or to start collaborating with others? So we've had this one in mind from the very beginning and so excited that this is our graduate lightning round, hopefully the first of many, where we're going to have very brief overviews, which is a very difficult thing to do. It's much easier to speak for an hour on a topic, but we have put a big challenge out and we have seven brilliant young uh, candidates who have accepted the challenge to present their entire research in four minutes or less. So we're really excited to have this today. I'm going to hand over to Khalil to introduce our first speakers. Please be nice to everybody, please. And we know you will at such a great audience in the chat. Please send through questions. After the speakers have presented, we have allowed them to, to go on YouTube and answer any questions that come up. So please do send through questions, send through your feedback. We know that that feedback is going to be really useful for all the presenters today. So Khalil, who have we got up first? Thanks, Sally, and thanks for that overview of everything. And let me just echo all the sentiments that you've uh, given about the whole point of this seminar and how excited we are to have all of these talented graduate students uh, joining us this week. So our first speaker for the day, uh, who has four minutes, plus or minus a little bit, we, we don't mind if there's a little bit of a rounding error there, it's, we're not too strict on any of these things, is James Whedon of the University of Salford. So I'm going to hand the floor over to James and then we'll come back with a quick question then I'm sure you'll see him in the chat box if we have any more follow-up questions. So James, the floor is yours. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you for having me on. Um, does gambling merely redistribute wealth from the poor to the rich? This is what Nick Cohen argued in New Statesman in 2003, that if you walked into a betting shop, there's only ever going to be one winner, the bookie. In 2020, the narrative in the press appears to be much the same, but the industry is transformed technologically. My research focuses on the development of platform gambling within the land-based betting industry and how it's perceived as redistributing wealth to the industry's owners. The, stu the study doesn't uh, construct the link to problem gambling per se, but rather builds the theoretical understanding of the role of platform gambling and its impact on owners, customers and employees of betting shops alike. The three elements of platform gambling are shown in the top left hand corner of the slide. Fixed odds betting terminals or fob as they're known, the crack cocaine in the industry and since April 2019 reduced to £2 per spin. Then on the left, we have self-service betting terminals or SSBTs, self-service machines which allow customers to wager on a wider variety of sports than will be available traditionally over the counter. 
And finally, internet gambling, half of which in the UK is done on mobile phones. These are all significant sources of income for betting shops, interwoven with over-the-counter betting for an omnichannel approach. So how does my research explore the development of platform gambling? I conducted 35 semi-structured interviews with owners, employees and customers from betting shops in the southwest of England. They were asked about the development of platform gambling and its impact on things such as marketing, shop uh, environment and also working conditions. The responses were varied. Everyone thought that SSBTs were great for customer experience, but were a risk to jobs. The internet, meanwhile, was described as killing shops slowly, yet employees were expected to promote internet gambling, with the pressure to hit such targets described as being like a million tons of bricks. The, st the state limits on FOBTs, meanwhile, which were themselves described as cancerous, were regarded as ineffective, meaning that players would rather just take longer to lose their money on the machine, or they gambled online with no instructions instead. The experiences given were then explored from a critical realist philosophy, answering the, the main research question on the slide. Key themes were analysed to produce a structure caused by the development of platform gambling. The most emergent theme was the profitability of platform gambling, characterised by reduced over-the-counter trade and a subsequent reduction in labour and shop fabric-based costs. This profitability transfer translates into the alteration of situational or structural characteristics. There's more to gamble on and it's easier to access. This is bad news as employees, this is bad news for employees as users can easily gamble on Champions League football, horse racing, slots games, you name it, without even talking to a cashier and sometimes in the comfort of their own home. The productivity offered by data was evident and the owners were perceived as promoting platform gambling through intense marketing campaigns. Surveillance capitalism was a key theme. User data was strongly linked for the harvesting for the provision of free bets or bonuses based on player spend. On television, the whistle-to-whistle -whistle band was perceived as ineffective with televised advertisements still, still omnipresent, whilst adverts were also deemed as ubiquitous on social media. Again, these adverts were promoting platform gambling, extracting further spend and making employees redundant. These mechanisms then lead us to our conclusion that platform gambling, our few, so FOBTs, SSBTs and internet betting, are fuel, is, well, is fueling perceptions of a class struggle between betting company owners and their shop employees and customers. Employees perceive themselves as a dying breed due to platform gambling, whilst the user data is perceived as extracting further spend from a customer base. The study therefore makes a theoretical contribution on how new gambling technologies can cause a detrimental socioeconomic impact to different stakeholder groups. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, James. That was a really interesting talk. I guess um, now I'm on the spot trying to come up with a question to ask you. And um, the question that I have is related to this idea of um, employment. And one of the things that we talk about in economics is creative destruction. So when there is innovation, you know, there's jobs that are lost, but then there are jobs that come out of it. So uh, with this concept that you've described, you've talked about the transfer of wealth to the business owners, but are there any other types of employees um, or anybody else somewhere in the supply chain that does benefit from this type of redistribu redistribution from you know, person to person gaming interactions to more uh, remote style platform as you described? In terms of shop-based environment, um, there wasn't any sort of positive element of the development of platform gambling for employees. You know, they were under quite considerable pressure to sell, advert sell internet betting, the problem gambling aspect of, um, you know, trying to uh, hold a responsible gambling interaction with uh, someone who may be losing too much in the FOBT was stressful. And SSBTs were generally seen as a threat to employees in a land-based setting. In terms of anyone in the supply chain, I guess the perception was that those in a senior role or those who worked in a head office who were responsible for the rolling out of these platforms were probably going to benefit. But that really is on a small scale compared to those numbers who are currently working in the betting shop at the moment. Yeah, so thank you very much. That's uh, it's a very interesting topic when we think about one of the main reasons why gambling gets legalized in many jurisdictions is because of the economic benefits and the jobs that comes along with it. So um, that's a very interesting, unique take on that. So for our next speaker, thank you, James. Uh, thank you. For, for enjoying us. Um, and for our next speaker, I will pass the mic back over to Sally. Thank you, Khalil, and thank you, James, for that interesting uh, perspective on things. So next, I'm delighted to introduce Karen Tang from Dalhousie University in Canada. 
Thank you so much for having me. So what if I told you right now that one of your loved ones have just been diagnosed with gaming disorder? This might be a friend, a significant other, or your child. How might you react? In mid-2018, the World Health Organization added gaming disorder or video game addiction to the international classification of diseases, meaning gaming disorder is now a very real and diagnosable condition. Now, this may or may not be surprising to you as you might be able to recall someone in your life, including that person you thought about at the very beginning of this presentation that might spend a little bit too much time gaming. However, we still know very little about this disorder. And with the International Olympic Committee considering adding esports, which is competitive video gaming played for spectators by professional gamers to the Olympic Games in the near future, the urgency to determine the precise factors that facilitate gaming disorder is more paramount than ever. So we know that current literature has found that adult attachment styles linked to addictive behaviors. Attachment is how individuals develop and maintain patterns of social interaction and emotion regulation. It is developed in childhood and remains rather stable throughout the lifespan. Child attachment theory posits that a strong emotional and physical bond to at least one parent is critical to development. Adult attachment theory extends on these principles to close personal relationships in adults, especially romantic partnerships. There's also growing literature that suggests that emotion dysregulation predicts psychopathology, including substance use disorders. Emotion dysregulation is characterized by difficulties in controlling impulses towards negative feelings, engaging in goal-directed behavior, and utilizing self-regulation skills. Given that both attachment style and emotion dysregulation have been rarely studied in the gaming literature, and the findings remain mixed, this is where my research comes in. The research question my study seeks to answer is, what role does attachment and emotion dysregulation play in problem gaming among university students? We hypothesize that one, insecure attachment is associated with symptoms of gaming disorder, as well as emotion dysregulation, and that two, emotion dysregulation mediates the association between insecure attachment and gaming disorder. So in other words, among individuals with more severe gaming disorder symptoms, those with greater insecure attachment will have greater emotion dysregulation, which will then lead to greater severity of gaming disorder symptoms. And this will be tested using a mediation model. So a mediation model is one that seeks to identify and explain the mechanisms or process that underlies an observed relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable through the inclusion of a third variable, the mediator variable. So for my study, I recruited 287 psychology students from the University of Calgary, and participants were invited into a computer lab on campus to complete a series of questionnaires. In terms of our findings, we found that both hypotheses were supported by the data. So as predicted, greater insecure attachment was significantly correlated with more gaming disorder symptoms and greater degree of emotion dysregulation. Critically, we found that emotion dysregulation significantly mediated the relationship between insecure attachment and gaming disorder. Essentially, we found that individuals who tend to be more insecurely attached and have greater difficulties regulating or controlling their emotions might be at a heightened risk for gaming disorder. So to conclude, the findings of the study may allow us to understand what might lead to excessive gaming by identifying risk factors of gaming disorder. A better understanding of these predictors may allow clinicians to identify at-risk populations and may permit gamers to seek help before gaming becomes a genuine concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, really interesting. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that last part that you were mentioning, the implications and the outcomes from your research. How do you think that the findings you're coming to will be able to inform prevention and treatment for gaming disorder? That's an excellent question. So the results of my study suggest that clinicians treating clients with problematic gaming or gaming disorder might want to incorporate emotion regulation strategies into their treatment plans for those insecurely attached clients, 
So we know from the literature that several therapies are currently targeting emotion dysregulation, including mindfulness-based therapies, such as um, mindfulness-based therapies that help teach individuals how to really effectively self-regulate their emotions. Um, and there appears to be some efficacy in treating addictive disorders. And is there anything about prevention? Um, I'm not quite sure in terms of prevention. Fair enough. We've got a little bit more time left to, uh, to figure out that chapter of the thesis. Thank you very much, Karen. Really interesting. Khalil, who's up next? Well, next we have a person I think you're very familiar with, Sally, is uh, Tom Swatton from the University of Sydney. So Tom, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Khalil, and hi, everyone. Let me start by asking you a personal question. How much cash do you have in your wallet right now? My guess is it's about enough to buy lunch and maybe a couple of coffees. You might not even carry cash anymore. Your smartphone might be all you need. World Pay forecasts that in three years time, nearly one in three payments in retail outlets are gonna be made using smartphones. There are reports that the coronavirus is accelerating this shift away from cash. Authorities and industry are encouraging consumers to use contactless payment methods to help reduce the spread of the virus. But zooming into what we're all interested in, how does this shift towards cashless payment methods impact gambling? Land-based gambling venues in most jurisdictions are still mainly cash-based. If you want to play on a slot machine, you typically load credits by inserting your banknotes or coins to play. Semi-cashless payment technologies like ticket in, ticket out, and loyalty card payment systems have been around for a while in some jurisdictions. But a number of venues, particularly in the US and Australia, are now trialing the next generation of cashless payment systems. With some of these newer payment technologies, you could buy in on gaming machines or at a casino table game using your bank debit card or a, digital wallet or a digital wallet or payment app on your smartphone that's linked to your bank account. Cashless payments might provide a more seamless entertainment experience for venue patrons. They also mean you don't have to carry around huge amounts of cash with you. But what does cashless gambling mean in relation to someone's risk of developing a gambling problem? Does cashless gambling increase the likelihood of someone spending more than they intend to or more than they can afford? And is this effect significant even after we take into account all the other important factors like how much the person gambles overall? In terms of this potential negative impact, only a few qualitative studies in the gambling field have looked at this to date. And there's some evidence that digital payment might make it more difficult for some people to stay in control of their gambling. Some people report that digital money seems less real compared to cash. And this is generally consistent with broader findings from the consumer psychology literature, which suggests that we're generally less aware of our spending and willing to spend more when we pay with cashless methods like debit cards compared to cash. Cashless payment technologies that are linked directly to the user's bank account have the potential to substantially increase access to funds for gambling. The person might not even have to get up from their seat at the gaming machine or the casino table game to access more funds. And overall, this might facilitate some people spending excessive amounts of time and money gambling and reduce the likelihood of them taking a break or having interactions with venue staff, both of which are thought to help reduce risk. But this potential negative impact is only part of the picture because although cashless payment methods might increase someone's risk of overspending, New payment technologies also present us with opportunities to be creative and innovate in how we design harm minimization strategies and tools. Electronic transactions can be tracked much more readily than cash payments, making it much easier to get an overview of someone's overall gambling behavior and to identify people who might be at higher risk. Digital wallets and payment apps can also be specifically and intentionally designed to minimize risk of harm in ways that just aren't possible with cash. This built-in harm minimization functionality might look like default deposit limits that are configurable to the individual's financial situation. We could also integrate personalized feedback into payment apps to provide individuals with reminders and visualizations that help to inform their choices about how much they're spending. The shift to cashless seems pretty much inevitable. 
My research aims to make recommendations about the design of cashless payment technologies for gambling harm minimization. This will help to make people. Uh, this will help people to make smarter decisions about their gambling expenditure in the age of digital payments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, that's such a timely subject for you to be studying right now. I, I get questions about this all the time, and as you say, this is something that's inevitable. As we think about the, the idea of this becoming inevitable. Uh, I know you kind of talked about a few different concepts of how this could be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, in terms of the research catching up, and I, I know you mentioned that there's only a, a couple of qualitative studies. What, in your mind, perhaps this is something that you've designed or you've been thinking about, what are the, the first study or two that we really need to be focusing on? What are the, the, the specific aspects of these payment systems that we, we need to narrow in on if you're gonna design a study to look at these things sort of as a building block towards understanding them more holistically in, in gaming environments? Sure, that's a great question. I think, um, and that's um, something that I'd really like to do. If possible, it would be ideal to do that um, as part of an in-venue trial. Um, I'd love to do that as part of my PhD if, if the opportunity arose, but it that might also look like um, me conducting some incentivized lab-based experiments to look at the impact of manipulating payment method on um, different measures of gambling behavior. Um, and the interesting thing, as I was kind of alluding to at the end there, is that with digital payment methods, um, we can kind of uh, manipulate some of the um, character, like the structural characteristics about the payment method, like the amount of feedback, the frequency of feedback that people receive that might help to make the amount that they're spending more salient and help them to make more in informed decisions about how much they're spending. So um, it would be great to then kind of take it a, a step further from um, just looking at the impact of, say, someone spending with a, a credit card or a debit card compared to cash um, or their smartphone compared to cash, but then also manipulating um, the amount of uh, feedback, for example, um, that the, um, the digital wallet or smartphone payment app provided to them and see whether that can help them to um, to take better control over their the gambling behavior if it's a problem for them. And in terms of those gambling behaviors, we're probably looking at something like loss chasing is, is probably the most interesting variable there. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, different measure, um, and also I think uh, withdrawal, um, yeah, deposit and withdrawal activity are the, uh, two of the main ones I've, I've been thinking about. That's great. Well, I snuck in an extra question there, so I'm gonna quickly hand the microphone back to Sally. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, Khalil. Uh, so our next speaker is Marta Saligo from the International Gaming Institute of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Thank you, Marta. Can you hear me? We got you. OK, so I start back. Okay. The buildings on these slides are the two casinos of Venice, Italy. The two pictures on the left portray Cavendra Mincalergi, which went from being the house of several noble families for more than five centuries to becoming a casino in 1959. The other modern looking building on the bottom right is Canoguera, opened in 1999. Both of them are owned by the municipality of Venice, the city where the first casinos in Europe are born in the 16th century. At that time, besides the gambling, casinos were important meeting points for everyone, from nobles to criminals. Therefore, in Venice, since the very beginning, casinos and their game shaped the city's lifestyle, with so scholars today seeing them as intertwined with the city's cultural heritage. Interested in understanding how Venice's municipality uses the historic role of casinos to promote these two attractions, I conducted textual analysis of different kinds of websites, especially of local tourism authorities. And I focus on two main findings. Firstly, as a sociologist interested in cultural heritage, every time I am in Venice and I walk by the stunning Renaissance-style building of Cavendramin Calergi, I wonder, is this just a gambling-related tourist attraction? 
Hospitality, liter hospitality, hospitality literature, we know, often emphasize the use of single categories. But as this case makes, makes clear, both gambling and cultural heritage are big draws here. Interestingly, the homepage of the casino itself, instead of just focusing on the gambling offer, centers on the fact that its central location on the Grand Canal and its artistic value make this location a unique witness of the city's history and cultural fabric. After a careful investigation, therefore, I understood that the answer to my question is yes, this venue falls under the category of cultural tourism and not only gambling tourism. Secondly, I ask myself, what about the role of Venice's traditional games in today's context, which is marked by an exponential technological growth? Although both casinos offer the same classic and technology-based ga games, I noticed that on the official website, Cavendra Mincalergi is promoted as the sophisticated theater of the most classic games, while the same website depicts Canoguera as Italy's first American style casino with over 5,000 square meters of entertainment. This comparison is constant here. When it comes to games, the goal is to promote Cavendra Mincalergi as the witness of tradition and Canoguera as the place for technological innovation. I think reflections like this are important, not only for gambling studies, but scholars can rethink of the role of historic casinos and classic games, but also for hospitality and tourism studies, whose experts should reflect more on how, in today's travel market, we don't have, we don't have fixed categories anymore. Sociological studies reveal that travel motivation in contemporary society are fluid and dynamic. As this research shows, Technological advancement does not only win over traditions, and also a casino can acquire new meanings, for example, becoming a cultural tourism attraction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. That's a really interesting take. I have, I have a few questions, so I'll start with one. I, I'm interested in this comparison. I, I was interested in the term that you used, Amer American-style casinos. And that this obviously the way that casinos are created in different countries and different cultures uh, varies and that even within countries, there's different styles of venues. Similarly, in Australia, we have some casinos in heritage style buildings and some, I think one that was referred to as, you know, uh, a glorified club with electronic palm cheese, like totally tacky over the top, but that was where they were going for. So what do you think customers appreciate? You're talking about, you know, the scholarly aspect, but how do you think patrons and customers see the different styles of gambling venues? And does that have an impact on the types of customers that go to different venues and how they behave inside? Of course, uh, as a sociologist of tourism myself, I can tell you that always patrons and tourists look for both, right? The authenticity and the past. Uh, so the classic Venice, Venice casino, so maybe Cavendra Mincalergi, the Renaissance style one, uh, is more like historic in that sense, uh, while there is a big draw for, uh, I will say, modern things and technological things, especially I can tell being an Italian myself when it comes to American style something. So I remember when I arrived in the first time in the Venice Casino was very interesting because I live in Las Vegas now and I felt like I was in Las Vegas in the same kinds of casinos. So I think that today is basically tourists look for both actually, but for sure when they go to Venice, uh, they probably expect more to see the classic games. And stealing from Khalil, I'll ask a, a quick sneaky follow-up question which is, do you see any cultural differences? And that's maybe a big question, but a, a snapshot of, of particular cultural differences in the approach of building casinos. Well, of course, like Italy is very regulated. We only have uh, three cities that can have casinos right now. So it's completely different. So of course, being used to like the resorts of Las Vegas is a completely different idea. In Europe, still they are trying to bring back the old tradition of casinos like Monte Carlo like um, Venice, uh, like San Remo on the Riviera. So there is this contrast also in terms of architecture and uh, hospitality venues. We usually in the US you have these big resorts. Thank you very much, Marta. And I'll hand over to Khalil now. 
Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Marta. Yeah, it's uh, interesting thinking about Las Vegas, where as soon as something becomes a classic venue, it immediately gets raised to the ground and replaced with something more shiny. So it's a really interesting piece of research. Uh, our next speaker is Marie Dietz. So Marie, you have the floor now. Thank you, and hi, everyone. I would like to start my presentation with a question. Would you prefer to pay in cash or card? All of us ask this question at least once a day when getting coffee or paying for our groceries. Most of us in Australia would probably answer this question with card. However, when we look at gambling, this is a totally different story because the only available means of payment in the gambling venue is cash. However, changes in technology have led to the introduction of cashless payment methods to foster responsible gambling, such as smart cards. And this will only advance further given technology and the current pandemic. In my master study, I aim to explore the differences in how individuals who gamble manage their gambling expenditure compared to other forms of discretionary spending. Research outside the gambling field says that consumers have the tendency to overspend while being less aware of their spending when digitally based payment methods are used compared to cash. And the reason why this is happening is because of the high salience of cash physically handling your money and the immediate feedback you get of seeing your wealth deplete when cash is used compared to a card payment. Also, you have to think less about the actual cost and affordability of a product when cashless transactions are involved. Okay, so why am I doing this research? There's a lot of research on discretionary goods when cashless payment methods are used. So I wanted to do the same for gambling, given the current lead technology advances. Because there's limited research regarding the impact of digital payment methods and gambling expenditure. And the few studies that are out there yielded contradictory results. As you can see on my slide, I used two arrows, one pointing towards cash and one pointing towards digitally based payment methods. And the reason I use these errors is because the lack of previous research did not allow me to generate any valid hypotheses for my study. And they meant to ind indicate that the outcome of my study can be binary. For my thesis, I set up an exploratory research design. We're aiming to get 180 participants who gamble from a student sample and a community-based sample through online recruitment. A series of survey-based instruments, including the PGSI, the financial well-being scale and attitude towards payment methods are used. I'm also using other forms of discretionary spending as a reference point to gambling. I'm asking participants what payment methods they use on other forms of items such as takeaway or personal shopping and whether this spending is within their means. And the reason I'm doing this is because these good display expenses that are non-essential and can occur in varying frequencies and different amounts, such as gambling. Ultimately, this will help us answer whether cash has an influence on controlled consumer spending among a subsample of gamblers, and whether digital payment methods, if made available in the future, could impact overspending of gamblers. It's also an exploratory study, so it can help provide vital information for the feasibility of a much larger project and also hopefully help with generating some predictions for potential implications for policies related to cashless payment options and gambling. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marie. That was a great presentation. I want to dial in one of the things that you said earliest in, in early in your presentation, which was th that you'd spoken about the cash versus non-cash payment mechanisms in your life and in other domains. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you perceive that comparison in other aspects of your life and how that might have motivated the way that you've approached this research topic. Well, I mean, especially in Australia, and I guess similarly in America, everything is cashless. You, you can go to the supermarket, you can pay any amount with your card or even with your um, digital wallet with a watch there's really no limit to different um, electronic devices anymore. And um, I thought it was particularly interesting because especially in the younger generations, no one really carries much cash. Whereas if you go to a gambling venue, it's so common to have 
to pay in cash due to the governmental restrictions. And it's just interesting to see because some people maybe are aware of their spending when they use cashless payments because they set up notifications on their phone when they use their, when they tap their card in the store or they um, use online transfer and always get notifications. Whereas for me personally, if I use cash, um, like I, um, I don't, I may think about more whether I pay for an item or buy a certain item, but um, I'm not aware of how much cash I have on me and how much cash I spend at the end of the day. Whereas it's much easier to track when you have um, everything digitally. That's great. Uh, and yeah, so, you know, obviously a lot of uh, themes from your work overlaps with Tom's and, and there's just yeah. there's so much research to do in this space. So one of the things that, that often comes up in the, the cash versus uh, other payments is not just the responsible gambling aspect, but also the, the money laundering aspect as well, because um, in those cases, it's nice to not use cash because it's a lot easier to track the source of funds. So uh, lots of work yet to be done and I'm glad that, that you're working on it. So thank you so much, Marie. I am going to pass the conversation back over to Sally now. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Khalil. So our last speaker for this morning is Javier Morris Alguero from the University of Santiago de Compostela. Thank you very much, Javier. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I have found uh, that in this series of seminars, one of the many underlying topics has been the conflict between the ideal situation versus the situation that has to be addressed in a given moment. And since my PhD plan is in its very first stages, I decided to review it from the perspective of the ideal research versus the, the research that we have to do in, in the actual context. Uh, this will be a, a gaming and gambling uh, prevalence study focus on giving uh, prevention tools adjusted to the uh, context in which the uh, research we build on, in this case in North Spain. The first component of the, of the research will be the sample. Uh, we would like to have a representative sample to, in order to to, to achieve this, uh, we will uh, address uh, to the schools, since we are aiming to children ages 12 to 17, uh, we will need uh, the agreement from the parents, from the student, and also from the school staff. The school has always been very aware of time, and post-COVID it has been aggravated. And also we have found that some school don't want to participate in gambling studies since they don't think that it is a relevant topic or they don't think that uh, children should be talked uh, about gambling. And this might result in us having to give up in the representative sample. The next step and the first component uh, will be the, sum, the, the prevalence. Uh, of course, uh, a clinical interview is not possible. So the, the actual option that we have are of course the screening questionnaires. And in this case, this uh, is a limitation to our conclusions. And also the, the, the screening questionnaires uh, mark the minimum amount of questions that we will have to include in the survey. The associated variable, variables are the most interesting part. There are many questions that we would like to ask, but also here uh, we are always in the risk um, affecting the quality of the data. Since if we add uh, too many questions, uh, the teenager will start to answer at random or leave the question blanks. So about the context, we would like to know uh, who introduced them to Gamble, uh, who do they gambling win and in which context? These are actually key questions that we don't expect big problems uh, with. It's in the risk and protect factors when probably cuts uh, will have to be done. Uh, for example, uh, regarding video games, uh, there is a list of 37 characteristics proposed by King et al. that include all the elements that may make a video game engaging. Is we have this list, uh, along with the context and the demographic data, 
we will have a picture of the subject, the object, and the context, which will be uh, very useful for, preven for prevention. However, we are talking about 37 questions, and this could be a problem for the amount of questions. So a solution could be using only the 15 that explain more, uh, that add more explicative factors to the to the gaming disorder in the in the previous studies. Uh, this will offer a less clear picture, but uh, will us allow to, to get more quality data. And summarizing, uh, the same sacrifice and balances have to be done for, for all the variables, uh, which in the good side will obligate us uh, to choose only the best elements according to the existing uh, evidence and will, whenever it's possible, make uh, this a gain of quality over quantity. Uh, this uh, is a brief uh, resume of the content of the, of the plan that we are starting to, to make. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Javier. That's a really interesting study. I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome of that. I was wondering if in your review of the literature and research to date, there's any uh, single or uh, you know one or two factors you think might have a predominant influence in terms of risk factors, if you think going forward, or, if, or that will be weighted relatively equally? Well, uh, one that we are looking to uh, especially is the um, sports. Since sports has always been a protective factor for many, uh, for uh, the alcohol, co alcohol consumption, drug uh, consumption, but uh, for gambling, this might be the opposite. Uh, and not only the opposite, but as you said, we expect this, uh, uh, we expect this to be a big, uh, uh, a, a big uh, factor. I, we expect that, that the participating in a sport or watching sports will play a big role in as a risk factor for gambling in, in children's uh, this young. Sorry. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's been such a pleasure to hear a snapshot of all of these presentations. We do have a little bit of time, so we're going to throw one more question at each of our participants. But to keep things simple, it'll be the same question that will come around to each of you to ask. So obviously, this is the Technology Risk and Gambling webinar series. And I've certainly found in my own work that as the field is so dynamic and technology is changing so quickly, uh, that my research topic can change halfway through. And I imagine that you've all found that given you're all undertaking multiple years worth of research. So what I would like to ask each of you, and I'll start with you, James, is to what extent has emerging technology changed your research area or is it changing right now? And how are you designing your research to be able to adapt to dynamic changes in the gambling environment so that when you finish your research, it's still gonna be relevant going forward? It's a really good question. Um, the, the, a bigger dynamic possibly, um, what the sort of the, focusing on the technology in the betting shop, is what impact the COVID lockdown has had on the use of, of said technology. Um, I think a guest last week, Steve Sharman, termed it beautifully when he said that every gambler is different and therefore the impact is, is just unknown at the moment. So really it's going to be a case of waiting to see what the long-term impacts of, of the COVID lockdown are in terms of the size of the industry, uh, whether there's been migration to other platforms or other types of gaming or betting then really adapting a longitudinal approach to uh, keep the thesis relevant, as it were. Excellent. Yes, obviously, we are all very well aware right now of how the situation is changing and research needs to be quite adaptable. I think all of those trying to do face to face studies are very well aware of that as well. Karen. So I think as gambling researchers and now that there's gaming, um, we were questioning and wondering if whether gambling or gaming are linked specifically through loot boxes. 
Um, so we have a study proposed that we're hoping to look at um, examining loot box use and whether that's associated with um, greater severity of gambling and gaming disorder symptoms. Um, so I think once we can really tease apart that relationship, that will really allow us to discern whether gaming or problem gaming might lead to problem gambling and whether problem or whether problem gambling might lead to problem gaming. Excellent, certainly very relevant. Tom. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I think um, in the payment space, one of the main um, widespread changes um, is the, the increasing use of digital wallets and smartphone payment apps. Um, I mentioned at the, be the beginning of the talk that in three years time, it's projected that one in three payments are gonna be used, made, um, it, one in three payments in, in retail outlets are gonna be used, um, made using uh, digital wallets. Um, and then in terms of the second part of the question, I think it really, um, for me, comes back to the importance of theory, having a strong uh, theoretical uh, basis for the research identifying um, the structural characteristics and the mechanisms that are at work in different um, payment methods and, um, and how that uh, relates and interacts with gambling behavior. So understanding things like whether um, the, the impact of um, whether the payment method is tied to a line of credit, uh, whether it's um, digital or, or physical in nature, like a digital wallet or a physical credit card, for example, or debit card, um, whether the gambling is done online or in person in a land-based venue. Um, and then, as I was also mentioning in my talk, the amount of feedback and the frequency of feedback that is inherent in the, in the payment method. So understanding these, the impact of these specific um, uh, structural characteristics, I guess, of the payment methods and how that relates to gambling behavior is, is going to be important for um, for the research to have ongoing relevance, regardless of what um, payment methods um, are developed uh, and become uh, commonplace in the future. Thank you, Tom. Yes, obviously, digital payments are highly affected by emerging technologies. Uh, Marta, I, I would previously have thought that, you know, buildings are relatively steady and don't change rapidly, but obviously we've seen massive changes in how technology can influence everything from, I've seen the development of, you know, fibres that clean themselves recently. So the, the building of casinos or even the alteration of existing buildings is also being impacted by technology. Have you looked at anything along these lines in your research? So yes, yeah, so with the International Gaming Institute, the research center, we are really analyzing like the industry reaction to coronavirus. So we, so we are noticing like a big, big increase of uh, like uh, safety measures uh, and sanitizing tools for casinos. So concerning the, I, the, the Venice uh, context is really interesting because you have to understand that at, at the moment, like Italy uh, was, a, it was one of the most affected countries by the COVID-19. So it will be interesting, especially Venice, like the Veneto region of Venice was really affected so I will be interested to see how the casino will recover if it will recover and if like technological innovation that usually uh, when we are talking about heritage sites cultural heritage sites is very hard to blend technology and tradition how they will react for now is a little bit too soon to know especially because Italy just uh, uh, is just trying to recover right now, but with no international tourists being able to go to Venice, I'm sure they are going to change the offer quite a bit. Thank you very much. And Marie, we've also seen obviously huge changes in how people are making payments and some places have actually banned the use of cash. So digital payments versus cash is extremely relevant to be studying. Obviously there's an acceleration towards digital through uh, the available technology and tap and go watches and phones. How, how is your research going to be future proofed or how are you designing it now so that's going to be relevant years into the future? Yeah, so um, as you said, and also Tom in his presentation, this is a very topical 
um, research project. And um, as mentioned, Australia is meant to go cashless by 2022. And the change of technologies is the very core that motivated my research because it's interesting to see um, and get a better understanding on how people spend nowadays, how people want to spend on gambling, and whether you know the, the previous research that says cashless is, is related to overspending, whether this is really the case um, also beyond the gambling field and how we can kind of use that information to lead back to the gambling field and um, who is actually adopting um, to these messages and how can we challenge these new message messages and um, benefit from emerging technologies. Um, and as my, my study is a pilot study, so it will give us a preliminary idea of spending patterns which can then lead to the design to a much larger study and ties in nicely with the work that Tom is doing. Um, so I guess also given the you know, current pandemic, everything is now online. Actually, we plan to do the research in land-based venues. So it'll be interesting to see how everything changes given the current pandemic. And um, yeah, it's gonna be very beneficial looking at the prospect of going cashless completely. Thank you, Marie. And finally, Javier, obviously the gaming world is, is highly impacted by technology, particularly since new games are constantly being developed and what was the most popular game last year won't potentially even be around next year. So how is your research coping and dealing with the, the changing nature, particularly across, across generations and how people engage with games moving forward? Yes, precisely. This has been a topic of debate in, in the team since we want to, to address the, the main trendings uh, that the, the children are now uh, playing or are relevant for them. But uh, when the research uh, is published, this might be outdated. Uh, so, uh, as I said before, there are uh, we can uh, aim to the characteristics or to the core uh, elements of the the video games or the the, the different activities uh, related to gambling in the internet. Uh, so uh, we can compare even if uh, we don't talk about Fortnite or any game that is relevant now. Uh, I, a research in five years might talk about a different game. Uh, if, they, if they compare the, the key element of, the, of this game or the characteristics that uh, have been found to be relevant and to, be, to maintain the people engaged in the game, uh, these, two these two research uh, can be actually compared. Well, thank you very much, uh, Javier, for uh, answering your question. And as well, thank you all for joining us this week and, and answering all of the questions that both I and Sally had for you this week. It's just a wonderful thing to see all of the new and exciting research and all of the uh, energy being put into the field right now, which for me, you know, brings to mind some of the wider issues that are starting and, you know, have continued to emerge in our field, which is around the nature of funding for research. And this is, you know, something that we often hammer at every week is the need for application or research in different areas. But when I think about where does the rubber really meet the road in terms of the importance of finding funding for gambling related research, it's for uh, projects like those that you've all described here today that integrate what are the newest trends happening in the world, both in and outside of gambling, and how does it relate to this overall gambling ecosystem? Because gambling truly is an interdisciplinary field. And we think about where research funding should come from. Some people think that maybe it's from regulators, or some people think maybe we need funding for behavioral addictions more generally. But really, gambling integrates a lot of different fields and ideas together. And the most productive research happens when we're able to look at these projects as a whole with collaborative and integrated teams. And what we're starting to see in the world right now is a lot of these issues are being forced on the gambling industry to deal with, whether that's things like touchless payments or that's things like um, gaming, integrating more 
gambling elements in them or vice versa, whether that's things like cryptocurrencies and crypto betting where there isn't as much regulatory oversight. Typically, we see that the gambling industry and gambling regulation has been relatively risk averse and slow to adopt new things. But now that we're starting to see more uh, forms of technology being forced on the industry, we're really going to have to start to adapt and figure out how do we answer these questions a lot quick, more quickly than we have in the past. And that, of course, takes research and it takes funding for research. And when we see places like Ontario or Nevada that, and you know, other places around the world where we're starting to see those research dollars uh, pull back, I think as you know, an overall community, we not start, need to start thinking about how do we integrate and collaborate on finding the right way to advocate for the need for gambling research and the need for gambling research funding. And you know, when, when I see these presentations and young people that I want to be able to do their research and I want them to be able to find jobs in the field after they graduate, you know, that, that just is something that becomes that much more poignant. So I hope that there's something that we can all take from these great talks that we've had this week, as well as all of the early career researchers that have come before uh, in these past, I think it was 16 weeks that Sally mentioned at, at the start of this presentation. So uh, this is wonderful to see, and I'm really excited for what comes next in our field. As Sally mentioned at the start of this presentation, one of the things that we're going to do is send out a very, very short survey. And I know all academics say this is going to be a short survey, but this really will be a short survey uh, asking about your experiences with this webinar. And, you know, the feedback just helps us uh, calibrate where we are right now because we all live in our own bubbles right now. And so it's, it's really helpful for us to see what your experiences have been like with the webinar and uh, understand where we should take this going forward. But for now, I will say thank you all to the speakers. Thank you for everybody that's shown up in the chat box or is viewing it at uh, wherever you might be right now. And next week, we're gonna have an exciting presentation on positive play. So going back into responsible gambling uh, once again. So for Sally and the Brain and Mind Center, as well as Harrison Stein, who we always thank for all of his help in producing. Thank you for coming this week, and we'll see you all again next week.